So welcome everybody. Welcome to our discussion on lithium ion battery management. I'm John Johnson from ST Microelectronics. Let's start out with a little bit of a poll. Let's find out how much experience our attendees have and what their level of interest in this, in this topic is. Go ahead and fill those out and we'll review the results in just a minute. Today we'll be discussing battery management and our chat will take less than an hour. We'll spend about a third of our time talking about battery basics. Now we're not going to discuss battery components like the anode, the cathode, the electrolyte, et cetera. Rather, we're going to highlight various battery chemistries, their characteristics and their use cases. Then we'll zero in on lithium ion battery technology. We'll talk about lithium ion battery characteristics as well as different battery management architectures. And we'll round out our talk by briefly introducing you to battery management solutions from ST Microelectronics. So first let's examine some foundational concepts. So according to Wikipedia, a battery is a device consisting of one or more electrochemical cells with external connections for powering electric devices like flashlights, mobile phones, electric cars, etc., Historically, the term quote unquote battery specifically referred to a device composed of multiple cells. However, the usage has evolved to include devices composed of a single cell. Primary or single use or disposable batteries are used once and then discarded as the electrode materials are irreversibly changed during discharge. A common example is an alkaline battery used in flashlights and a multitude of portable electronic devices. Secondary or rechargeable batteries can be discharged and recharged multiple times using an applied electric current. The original composition of the electrode can be restored by reverse current. Examples include lead acid batteries used in vehicles and lithium ion batteries used for portable electronic devices such as laptops and mobile phones. Batteries come in many shapes and sizes from miniature cells used to power hearing aids and wristwatches to small thin cells used in smartphones to large lead acid batteries or lithium ion battery packs and vehicles. And at the largest extremes, huge banks of batteries the size of rooms that provide standby emergency power for telephone exchanges and data centers and whatnot. So end product requirements greatly influence the characteristics of the battery employed, if a battery is incorporated at all. If energy storage is required, then several factors or even many factors come into play when choosing battery technology. These parameters include physical, electrical, environmental, and commercial aspects. Shown here is a list of battery selection criteria. Obviously, the breadth of end-use applications necessitates various battery selection criteria, as is evidenced just by the length of this list. So here's what we're looking at as far as our poll is concerned. It looks like that we have a lot of people that have uh, some knowledge and hobbyists. There's a couple of experts out there. I hope I don't uh, disappoint you, experts. Uh, but uh, this is a good uh, uh, topic for all of you, given this knowledge level. So let's get uh, trudging on with some of our other topics here, our other slides. So let's look at some simple comparisons of a few rechargeable, that is secondary battery types. We're gonna, we're gonna forget about primary batteries from now on. We're gonna only talk about rechargeables. The graph on the left is related to a parameter called energy density, which we'll discuss in more detail a little bit later. For a given volume, different chemistries afford different energy storage capacity. The graph on the right considers specific power, again, which we'll discuss a little later, and specific energy. From this graph, we'll get an indication of which battery can deliver the most current for the longest period of time. If longer service time at higher current is desired, lithium ion appears to be the best choice. And its use is prevalent in many applications, including vehicle electrification, tools, and consumer products. So 
How uh, so? How significant are battery parameters? How do these uh, battery parameters, uh, let's call them figures of merit, how do they factor into the end product and how it performs? So tabulated below are some of these important figures of merit, as well as their units and how they affect this the end product. So energy density is probably the big one, especially for electric vehicles. Its unit is watt hours per liter. So how much oomph do you get? and how much space does it occupy? And that gives you an indication of compactness, but also if it's like a vehicle or a tool, how much time will it operate or run? How much energy can you take with you? Specific power is in watts per kilogram. That's uh, an indication of how much power and how much weight do you incur when you store that power. There's charge time and that's obvious um, in hours, it's time and it's basically an indication of utility. How long does it take to recharge uh, if a recharge is, is possible and required. Service life is, is stated in cycles, can be charge discharge cycles, or in years. It, it gives an indication of reliability, obviously, but also long-term costs. If it's a vehicle or something like that or a tool, you're going to have to go perhaps purchase a new battery pack toward the end of the service life of the battery. And then finally, cost itself, which is which is in uh, currency, and that's acquisition cost or replacement cost. So these are all significant figures of merit um, that we look at when we consider uh, different batteries. So let's examine how traditional alkaline batteries, which we talked about earlier, compare to various rechargeable choices for a few parameters of interest. These graphs evaluate things like weight and volume, shelf life, reliability, operating temperature, and cost. Uh, from a size and a weight perspective, the only rechargeable battery that rivals an alkaline battery is lithium ion. Alkaline batteries are by far the cheapest choice, and they exhibit very long shelf life. But the primary showstopper is that alkaline batteries are simply not rechargeable. If cost is no object, then lithium ion is a front runner. And as I mentioned before, it rivals alkaline batteries in terms of energy performance and demonstrates decent longevity. We're going to talk about the pros and cons of lithium ion battery technology in the next few slides. First of all, let's look at some transportation use cases. This is kind of interesting because it kind of underscores uh, that it, lithium ion uh, is not necessarily uh, cho chosen every time. So um, these are different transportation applications. The specific applications requirements for each use case warrants the use of appropriate battery chemistry. There are specific trade-offs and optimizations that must be achieved for each use case that we'll explore a little in a little bit more depth. But it seems like lead-acid batteries might be a leading candidate because of its cost effectiveness, and that is dollars per kilowatt hour. But there are other considerations, including power density. How big is that battery going to be, as well as specific power, which is how much is that thing going to weigh, to make lithium ion a more appropriate choice, depending on the application. So, in 2019, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry was uh, awarded to John Goodenow. Stanley Willingham and Akira Yoshino for their work associated with lithium ion batteries. So in honor of their accomplishments, let's talk a little bit about some characteristics of lithium ion batteries. First of all, let's talk a little bit about the, the number of charge and discharge cycles. Actually, this, this poll question is a little off, I think, because we probably need a choice that says less than a thousand. But why don't you enter in what if for your product, how many charge and discharge cycles are you targeting or would you expect to be reasonable for a lithium ion battery uh, design? Anyway, let's uh, go ahead and enter your answers and we'll look at the results in just a second. So lithium ion batteries have many advantages and it's no accident their use is now prevalent in rechargeable applications. Nonetheless, lithium ion has drawbacks Lithium ion is finicky to charge. Moreover, it is difficult to gauge a lithium ion pack state of charge. Lithium ion cells can be tricky as thermal runaway issues in consumer products like hoverboards have demonstrated. And finally, lithium ion is an expensive technology, not just because of the exotic materials comprising the cells, 
but also because of the complexity of the battery and thermal management systems that must be present to optimize uh, performance, safety, and battery life. Lithium ion cells are sensitive to operating conditions, including temperature, over voltage, over charging, and under discharging, to name a few. And we'll explore this in a little bit more detail. So when we say lithium ion batteries cost a lot, what do we mean? Here's an example of an electric vehicle. In uh, many other products have the same uh, characteristic, and that is the battery system is the most expensive component comprising the bill of materials. For this reason, batteries must be able to impact performance and functionality in a big way, commensurate with its relative cost. So the care and feeding of the battery pack is a big focus to ensure that it delivers the performance and longevity that justifies its cost. Now, while I showed one of these on an earlier slide, a Rigoni plot compares energy density of different energy storage devices. Often lithium ion cells manufacturers publish these plots as they provide a way to read the runtime in minutes and hours presented on the diagonal lines of the graph. In this case, the vertical axis plots power in watts and the horizontal axis plots energy in watt hours. The diagonal lines represent the length of time that the cell can deliver energy under specific loading conditions. This graph actually contemplates or uh, uh, provides uh, data for three different lithium ion cell types. There's lithium ion phosphate, which is the magenta line. There's lithium manganese oxide, which is the violet and blue plots on the graph. And then nickel manganese cobalt, which is the cyan plot on the graph. The Rigoni plot assists with battery selection by illustrating how different cells perform. Engineers can examine how much cells uh, how much power each cell is capable of delivering for a specific runtime. Let's give an example. The lithium ion phosphate cell, the magenta line, is capable of providing 40 watts for 3.3 minutes. The nickel uh, manganese cobalt cell, the cyan plot, um, it, it can provide 36 watts for that same period of time. So when uh, the operating time is significantly longer instead of... Uh, like 3.3 minutes, let's talk about 33 minutes, which is an order of magnitude longer, the power delivery performance relationship is reversed. The lithium ion phosphate cell delivers 5.8 watts, while the uh, nickel manganese cobalt cell delivers 17 watts for the same period of time. Now that we understand how different lithium ion battery types are selected, let's briefly go over lithium ion cell charge and discharge characteristics. Consider these graphs, which depict the charge and discharge characteristics for a typical lithium ion cell. Once a cell reaches saturation during charging or even when discharging, the cell voltage remains nearly constant for most of the operational envelope. You see how flat the, the cell voltage curve is. This flat discharge curve makes it very attractive as an energy source because the, because the battery provides nearly constant energy over a wide operational range. But this characteristic, along with other intrinsic qualities, presents battery management challenges, and these largely determine the operating time per charge, battery service life, safety, and the usability of the product. And what I mean by that is knowing how much battery capacity is available at any point in time. I also call this term kind of like fuel gauging. Uh, filling a martini glass is often used to illustrate the charging curve for a lithium-ion cell. If your martini is poured into the glass at a constant rate, the glass fills quickly initially. As the glass fill level reaches the midpoint, it takes more and more time to raise the level in the glass. And so it is with the charge uh, curve of a lithium ion cell. Let's examine charging a little bit closer. There are different stages to charging the charging process for a lithium ion cell. So after discharge, when charging the cell, uh, undergoes a constant current charging phase. The charge current is controlled and limited by the charger itself. During this initial phase, the level of charge raises quickly. Remember our martini glass analogy from the previous slide. While raising the charge current does not affect the total charge time, that is the time to reach the ready state, it can accelerate the time to reach the plateau of around 70% capacity. 
And this method is what the so-called superchargers employ. Uh, the maximum current allowed in constant current mode is, uh, for a given battery is set by the battery manufacturer. The next stage of charging is called the saturation charge. For this stage, the charger delivers constant voltage and the charge current is limited by cell impedance. This phase takes substantially longer to reach um, uh, the ready phase, which is the third phase. Different materials comprise the anode and cathode, which impact cell characteristics. For example, lithium ion cells charge from about 3.8 to 4.2 volts with a tolerance of just plus or minus 50 millivolts, depending on the anode cathode materials employed. The cell is considered fully charged when charge current re uh, falls below about 3% of the, the cell's ampere hour rating. Charging the cell to something less than 100% is desirable to extend uh, service life as lithium ion cells cannot accept an overcharge without some cell damage uh, and or a uh, compromise to safety. Prolonged overcharging leads to plating of metallic lithium on the anode. However, undercharging um, or, um, the cell obviously diminishes the capacity of the cell to deliver power to the appliance. You've got less capacity there. Therefore, charging is sort of a balancing act between capacity, cell longevity, and charge time. In describing batteries, current is often expressed as a C rate in order to normalize against battery capacity, which is often very different between batteries. A C rate is a measure of the rate at which the battery is discharged relative to its maximum capacity. So a one C rate means that the discharge current will discharge the entire battery in one hour. For a battery with a capacity of 100 amp hours, this equates to a discharge current of 100 amps. A five C rate for this battery would be 500 uh, amps and a C over two rate would be 50 amps. Similarly, an, uh, an E rate describes discharge power a one E rate is the discharge power, uh, the discharge power to discharge the entire battery in uh, in one hour. So let's talk about service like uh, life factors here. From the time a brand new lithium ion cell is installed in a product to the time that its capacity diminishes to the point at which the battery must be replaced or discarded. The cell undergoes several changes that impact its capacity to store energy. Now, these changes are brought about by either abuse of the cell, either by accident or because of poorly designed battery management, or by natural processes associated with aging. Now, as it turns out, most of these factors can either be eliminated or mitigated by incorporating a properly designed battery management system. Abuses to the cell include exposing the cells to overcharging or deep discharging for extended periods of time. Most rechargeable batteries can be overloaded briefly, but mu this must be kept short. Short deep discharge does not damage the cell. However, leaving the battery discharged for prolonged periods of time damages internal protective layers. The voltage level that a cell is exposed to during the charging phase can have a dramatic impact on cell capacity. Finally, one of the biggest culprits to diminishing cell capacity is exposure to high temperatures. While lithium ion cells do not readily take a charge when it's cold, exposure to high temperatures is the primary culprit for cell damage. This is why many high-end systems employ thermal management as part of the battery management system. The secondary category of factors that impact battery surface life is associated with aging. The number of charge discharge cycles that a cell undergoes can slowly damage the anode cathode of the cell as well as cause lithium plating. Lithium plating occurs during charging and has a couple of root causes. Higher charge currents force the lithium ions to move faster uh, at a faster reaction rate and thereby accumulate on the anode. If charging occurs at low temperatures, the reaction rate slows, impacting the inner calculation of lithium ions also causing lithium ion plating on the anode. Materials comprising the cell uh, also degrade with age, and this is called calendar aging. The adductor light can oxidize over time and structures like the passivation layer can degrade as well. So obviously most, uh, most of our uh, um, 
people attending today have a realistic uh, view of how many charge and discharge cycles they would expect. And I would expect that if we had something in the under 1,000 category, we'd probably have a distribution uh, uh, down there as well, probably most of you. So in commercial applications, lithium-ion batteries require protection mechanisms and circuits to ensure safety of the battery. There are well-documented instances of thermal runaway that they've been observed. Recall the hoverboard product's propensity to catch fire. Now, IEC 62133 defines the safety requirements for lithium-ion battery packs. The energy density of lithium-ion battery is roughly twice that of a NICAD. The battery comprises an anode, a cathode, and a liquid electrolyte uh, that is a solvent of lithium salts. This, uh, there is an ultra-thin permeable separator made of polyethylene that is approximately about 10 microns thick. A breach separator causes a short circuit that initiates thermal runaway. A shortened cell can eventually achieve temperatures exceeding 500 Celsius. The electrolyte can ignite and even become explosive when it's exposed to oxygen. So as more and more cells become hot, they either uh, short out due to the separator degradation, or they can be taken offline by the BMU, causing the rest of the cells to take the load current. And if left unchecked, the battery will undergo what's called a thermal uh, runaway, in which the load current is shouldered by fewer and fewer cells, causing the cells to remain online, and, and the ones that are online heat up, and that in turn causes some of them to go offline, which causes fewer and fewer of them shoulder the burden. So to avoid the cell temperatures as well as the current need to be constantly monitored and the battery needs to be control, uh, controlled accordingly. So we've learned a lot about the characteristics of batteries and lithium ion cells and some of the challenges managing the batteries comprising lithium ion. Now let's look uh, at how lithium ion cells can be managed using looking at BMU architectures. First, it should be obvious at this point, but managing lithium-ion batteries involves trade-offs, and these trade-offs present a challenging balancing act where parameters associated with service life, cost, charging, and operating time, and safety comes and works against each other. For example, charging the battery faster can affect surface life and maybe cause damage that impacts safety. Employing extensive monitoring and control facilitates better management that can optimize service life and operating time, but that, add that adds land line items to build materials and obviously cost as well. So with the aforementioned trade-offs in mind, there are certain key functions that a battery management system can and should provide. Some functions are obvious, like measuring the cell voltage, the currents, and temperature, while others may be new concepts to some of you, like cell equalization or balancing, for example. We're going to dig into all of these a little bit more next. This chart kind of gives you a few methods of gauging battery capacity and performance, as well as some basic pros and cons for each approach. Now, intuitively, monitoring the cell voltage to track the charge and discharge, and hence the capacity, seems like the simplest approach to implement. However, there are potential pitfalls. First, mid-charge lithium-ion discharge curves are flat, as we've talked about before. And so what makes it a very good energy source makes it difficult to gauge because you have to have very high-resolution signal path to quantify changes in the battery state or ba through measuring the voltage. So in, difference, in addition, cell voltage is impacted by load current as well as temperature variation, further complicating this issue. And even most papers that address lithium ion chemistry suggest that the battery be unloaded for a relatively long period of time before cell voltages are sampled. And so obviously, this is perhaps an impractical for some implementations where you can unload your battery, let it set, and then measure it to know what, uh, what, how much energy is, is left to do fuel gauging. Hydrometers is a way to measure um, capacity as well. Uh, it's employed on chemistries where the, it's, you have access to the fluid. Lead acid is a good example. If you've ever taken your car battery to a, a battery shop, they use a hydrometer. 
Uh, so for lead acid chemistry, sulfuric acid density increases as the uh, lead acid battery change, uh, charges. And this is measured using a hydrometer, which is basically a measurement of specific gravity. If the fluid level changes, the, um, uh, um, the ability to accurately estimate state of charge can also be affected. Um, but also there are um, instances where you really can't get into any fluid to measure specific gravity or uh, uh, density of the fluid anyway. And then the third method uh, that I'm gonna talk about is something called Coulomb counting. And what this is, is basically measuring amp seconds in and amp seconds out of the battery pack and integrating that. So it's really effective means of fuel gauging, but it's not without its drawbacks. It entails keeping a rolling tally of these things. Um, there's no battery chemistry that's 100% efficient in terms of charge and discharge, by the way. The other thing is that uh, gauging this on a per cell level is impractical uh, if you have a stack of batteries. Uh, typically what happens with uh, Coulomb counting is you have one sense resistor and you're measuring the, the current in and current out of the entire stack. So a fundamental component of battery management is something that we're calling a cell measurement unit, CMU. It contains control and instrumentation that helps monitor the state of charge on a cell-by-cell -cell basis for the entire battery stack. These include the ability to measure cell voltage on a cell-by-cell -cell basis, as well as stack current. Battery temperature must also carefully uh, be monitored to ensure uh, efficient charging, battery longevity, and battery safety. The measurement signal path of the CMU sh shown here must deliver requisite precision to estimate state of charge. Now, this is critical if parameters like operating time, charge time, battery life are to be optimized. Specifically, cell voltage and stack current measured and measurement precision are critical due to the flatness of the charge and discharge curves, as we've already discussed. In battery management solutions, sometimes incorporate Coulomb counting, which is the amp seconds in and out that I talked about before, as a cross check to estimate state of charge of the entire stack. To gain an understanding and some insight into how these parameters factor into battery management, consider something called JIDA guidelines for lithium-ion uh, battery charging. JIDA, which is an acronym that stands for Japan Electronics and Information Technology Industries Association. Um, this was a voluntary group that was formed uh, in reaction to battery fires that occurred in the consumer products in the mid-1990s. And since this time, battery construction and manufacturing has improved considerably. However, these scenarios kind of provide some insight into how uh, monitoring and controlling critical parameters like voltage, current, and temperature play a role in battery management. What JIDA recommends is, uh, is to vary the charge rate depending on the battery temperature to prevent cell damage. These graphs provide an intuitive example of how battery management is used to control the charging process. So in 2007, JIDA battery uh, charging safety guidelines uh, that stress the need to avoid high charge currents and voltages outside of certain cell temperature ranges. These recommendations noted that thermal runaway could occur if the cell temperature reached 175 degrees with a cell voltage of 4.3 volts. It also noted that safe charging could be implemented at temperatures up to 60 degrees if the charging voltage was limited and tightly controlled. So as we discussed earlier, the objective is to ensure that charging and discharging the battery is carefully managed. And this is not to manage uh, the, the range of the operating time of the product per se, the efficiency optimization, but it's also to maximize battery longevity. If an entire battery is charged at 50%, yet a single cell is at 80%, the results of charging the entire battery 80% would result in cell damage for a single cell on the stack. So cell balancing or cell equalization provides a mechanism to force all the cells to nearly identical levels of charge, thereby maximizing battery longevity as well as efficiency of the product. As the chart shows, without proper cell balancing, the longevity of the battery is impossible to maintain over a large number of charge and discharge cycles.
In addition to carefully monitoring, and in some cases controlling battery temperature, controlling charge levels can have a dramatic impact on battery life. Consider the chart on the left that plots battery capacity as a percentage of original capacity versus charge discharge cycles uh, uh, for different charge levels. And they can, you can see, so um, we're plotting a percentage of original capacity and a degradation of, of capacity over charge and discharge cycles. And as you can see, as we charge and discharge or use uh, uh, more and more of the entire range of the battery, the battery lasts for fewer and fewer cycles. So if you wanted a battery to last for a long, long time, you'd obviously want to use less of the entire range of the battery. So the cyan plot shows how capacity degrades when the battery management continuously charges the battery to 100% and then permits the battery to be discharged to 25%, nearly using the, the battery rail to rail. The magenta plot shows the results of charging the cells to 85% instead of 100%. And you can see that that has an improvement on the actual overall uh, uh, life of the battery in terms of its capacity to store energy. So in a lot of cases, what a product will do is, is uh, over the life of the product, it will use more and more of the entire range of the battery as uh, the cells degrade. But in order to extend the life of the battery, they won't use the entire range um, in terms of, of uh, charging it all the way up or letting it discharge all the way down initially from the onset to let the battery last. And you can think about it, if if the battery pack for an electric vehicle is $12,000, which means its replacement cost is close to $20,000, you really don't want that battery to fail uh, over the life of the product. So I've already introduced you to the cell me uh, measurement unit, the CMU, but it's worth touching on uh, it a little bit some more in the context of how it interfaces with the balance of the other components in the BMU. The cell monitoring unit, um, sometimes called a cell supervisor circuit or collectively a data acquisition unit, the CMU monitors cell voltage, temperature, and other cell level parameters. It also includes circuitry necessary for cell balancing. The CMU must measure several cell level and stack level parameters accurately. Recall the cell voltage during discharge is relatively flat, therefore high resolution is required for accurate state of charge estimation. This ensures that the battery is charged and discharged safely and efficiently and also prolongs battery life. Remember our last slide, we talked about uh, charging and discharging the battery over a very specific amount of its capacity. Well, this is how you do that. Ideally, cell voltage measurements should be taken simultaneously, in other words, all cells in the stack at once, to ensure that the algorithms have a true picture of the condition of the stack. Some CMU implementations multiplex the cell voltages into a single A to D. And by the way, this can be particularly problematic if you have hundreds of cells like in an electric vehicle. However, this assumes that all cells are stable over this entire sampling window and that the sampling itself does not affect measurement accuracy whatsoever. So the module ma ma uh, management unit or MMU manages and monitors collections of CMUs typically between eight and 16 cells. The MMU groups cells into a module and performs cell balancing across the module. It aggregates cell data and communicates with what we call the PMU, which is a pack management unit. The PMU is also sometimes called the central management unit. So it performs functions and its uh, scope is typically battery pack wide. It monitors pack parameters, including voltage and peak current. It controls and monitors safety devices, including switches and breakers. And it communicates with both the battery pack elements as well as the product as a whole. Um, it also typically controls battery pack heating and cooling if there are thermal, thermal management mechanisms there. Uh, generally, the PMU employs a microcontroller while the MMU does not necessarily contain a microcontroller. Depending on the number of cells in the stack and their proximity to one another, BMUs are implemented using one of three architectures, a centralized, a modular, or a distributed. 
The centralized architecture combines cell monitoring as well as uh, module and pack monitoring into one printed circuit board assembly. This might be a tool, a toy, or even a small scooter or whatnot where all the cells are in close proximity to one another. This obviously saves cost. This implementation is commonly used to support small numbers of cells, low capacity battery packs, et cetera. A typical use case is an electric bicycle or a power tool. Modular BMU architectures employ multiple instances of a module uh, management unit. These are, are near the battery cells and greatly reduce the complexity of the wiring. MMU share control and parametric data with the PMU via communications interface. It could be CAN or anything. And this means that the PMU requires the MMU uh, as a proxy for the state of the individual cells. Now, distributed architecture incorporates more than one pack ma uh, management unit that supervises a specific subset of modules or cells in the battery pack. And by the way, the communications interfaces and e electric vehicle are going wireless uh, between PMUs. PMUs can uh, work independently or can uh, coordinate activities depending on the use case and other requirements. And this architecture affords the most scalability and flexibility, but it's also the costliest and most complex. This approach is sometimes called the smart battery in that clusters have cells that have their own dedicated uh, MPU. Getting close to the end and then we can get to some, maybe some Q and A time, that would be good. So to wrap things up, let's take a quick look at uh, BMU solutions from ST Microelectronics. Here's a typical bill of materials for a BMU that implements a distributed architecture that we just talked about that has a uh, one CMU and then multiple MMUs and, and, uh, and PMUs. Aside from the CMU, MMU, and PMU blocks, the bill of materials combines the cooling fan control as well. Um, one particular component that I want to highlight here is the L9963, which we'll show in more detail later. That particular product uh, combine, combines a cell measurement unit and a module measurement unit in, into one chip, and it's pretty cool. Um, we'll talk about it uh, next. So let's talk about a, a hot, uh, high level block diagram of how this would all look uh, connected together to form a system next. Here's how the L9963 is used as part of the BMU chipset. So the L9963 includes the CMU and MMU functions and is used to monitor up to 14 cells per 9963. It can be used standalone for something as simple as a power tool, or you can cascade up to 15 of them in a 900 volt lithium ion battery stack. In this case, ST Microelectronics also offers an isolated transceiver so the stack can communicate to the MCU as shown. So let's briefly describe uh, what the L9963 does in the BMU system. So for every connected cell, the L9963 acquires cell voltages and temperatures and communicates this via a galvanically isolated interface to the main uh, processing unit. In addition, the L9963 uh, measures stack uh, uh, data via galvanically isolated interface but it provides current and also coolant counting to better estimate the state of charge as well as cell voltage. The CMU uh, directly uh, affects the KPI parameters of the whole battery, and the more accurately it can, can determine cell voltages, the better it can uh, utilize available cell capacity, and the more precisely it can drive higher level application parameters such as state of, ch state of charge. So to achieve effective charge balancing between cells, there's a passive balancing method that can be applied. A switchable load is placed in parallel to each cell so that during the, uh, the charge phase, the cell level of individual cells can be kept constant or slightly decreased in the case of the switch conducting. This balances the level of charge throughout the entire stack as cells with the non-conducting balancing bypass continue to raise their charge level. So the L9963 simplifies this passive balancing as it provides integrated MOSFETs such that only the externally 
balanced load is needed. Furthermore, the, the device offers several configuration options that facilitate autonomous and simplified control of this balancing process. So the acquired sensor data and diagnostic information must be transferred to the, a CPU using a galvanically isolated interface to properly separate the high voltage domains from the conventional um, uh, bus and supply. So the L9963 supports both a transformer or capacitor-based coupling to increase galvanic isolation. Uh, fast communication is key, and the L9963 allows data rates up to 2.66 megabits per second, which translates to an update interval of less than four milliseconds for a complete 400-volt battery stack. In this example, the battery consists of 96 cells uh, with seven of the L9963 managing uh, those, those devices. All these aspects from acquisition to sensor, sensor data um, uh, the integrity test of the measurements to transfer simple, uh, sample data as well as the permanent supervision of cells are safely cr safety critical for both operation of the uh, of the product. Uh, in a lot of cases, for instance, this product this product is used in electric vehicles, so it has to comply with ISO 26262 ASL D requirements. And this product actually has uh, that built in. Um, you'll notice, by the way, that in terms of uh, uh, cell voltage accuracy, the, the accuracy is plus or minus two millivolts, and it, it uh, samples the entire stack of current for coulomb counting at a, uh, an error rate of um, less than or equal to 0.5%. So these are the kinds of accuracies that you need to be able to gauge and extend the service life of the battery and and maximize uh, charge time and whatnot. So uh, anyway, I appreciate your time. Thanks for listening. Let's see if we've got any questions here that we can answer real quick. And uh, 